All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A Year On, Revisiting PrEP for HIV Prevention. I'm Lauren Berner, and I will be the moderator for the webinar presented by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. This is a 60-minute presentation, and we'll have some time at the end reserved for Q&A. Um, there is a chat box um, to the right of your presentation slides, so please um, chat in your uh, questions. If you have any technical issues, you can include those there as well. Um, a select number of those questions will be answered at the end and during the Q&A session as time allows. If you're having any technical issues, you can again place those in the chat or call Caroline Gumbenberger at 615-200-6165 for assistance, and that number is in the notes pod if you need it. Today we'll be joined by three folks from different VA programs who formerly worked together at the Homeless Patient Aligned Care Team, or HPAC Clinic, at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System. Last year around this time, this team joined us to talk about their HPAC work, specifically around PrEP initiation with patients experiencing homelessness. They're going to do a brief recap of that work, but the recording for that session can be accessed in the resource pod for you to view later if you'd like to dive a little bit deeper. Today, the team is spread across multiple VA sites in California and Nevada. Um, they continue to do work with VA um, either in HIV or with people experiencing homelessness. Today, we're going to talk a bit about their new roles and how the work with the HPAP and around PrEP has helped to inform some of that. This session will have more time for discussion than a formal presentation, so please sit back, listen in, and submit your questions in the chat. This webinar is presented with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration and the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. Um, the content is that of the presenters and is not necessarily endorsed by HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. Our presenters today are Carrie Lynn, who is a PACT pharmacist at the VA Sierra Nevada Health System, Sonia Jefferson, who is a hud bash social worker in Long Beach, and Elizabeth Gregg, who is a primary care provider at the San Francisco VA Healthcare System. They'll introduce themselves a bit more in a minute. Um, the learning objectives for today are visible on your screen, um, but I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know that um, the reason you're all here is to hear from our great presenters. Um, and they are going to go ahead and jump in. So I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And before I begin, I just want to say thank you for inviting us back. Um, this was a lovely uh, distraction in the middle of all of the work that I think all of us have been doing for COVID to kind of uh, have a moment to reflect on uh, the work that we were doing a year ago and where that work has taken us now. Um, so just to um, remind um, everybody, I'm sure there are people on the call today who were not um, with us in our presentation last year. Uh, the three of us, as well as a couple additional um, persons, were part of a QI project at the West Los Angeles uh, H-PACT clinic where we were trying to lower barriers to our homeless veterans to be able to uh, get appropriate HIV prophylaxis to prevent acquisition of um, HIV. When we started our project, uh, all HIV care, both preventative and um, treatment, was limited to the infectious disease department at West LA VA. And it seemed to us that a uh, good barrier to work on um, was to try to bring um, prescription of, of PrEP um, to the primary care setting. And so we spent a year working with VA infectious disease, with a pharmacy, with the leadership of the HPAC clinic to really understand what it would mean to bring um, the prescription and management of PrEP to primary care for a vulnerable population. Um, we know that um, PrEP continues to be underutilized among at-risk populations. and Part of those barriers are um, prescribers not feeling comfortable with PrEP, 
uh, difficulties uh, with uh, identifying uh, patients, in our case veterans, who meet the criteria for PrEP, and then really understanding how to partner with our resources and with our veteran population to ensure that they are able to get the lab work they need and to get the medication they need to continue to um, hopefully prevent the transmission and acquisition of HIV. So uh, as it so was multi-sectoral and we were working from a number of different um, venues to, to work for these. Um, and one of the biggest focuses that we had was really on educating our fellow providers and the clinic staff um, in terms of awareness, in terms of lowering anxiety, in terms of uh, giving prompt scripts to how to have conversations with um, our patient population about uh, risk behaviors, including IV drug use and uh, sexual behaviors that might put them at risk. And uh, we did find in the, uh, in the process that uh, a lot of providers were not asking uh, questions about uh, sex-related behaviors or injection drug use um, routinely. And so that became uh, one of the biggest things that we really worked on. Um, it, it turned out that the culture change in terms of um, the ID clinic was uh, was not the issue that we thought that it would be. Um, they were very enthusiastic to have more people looking to identify potential um, candidates for PrEP and were very happy to partner with us to um, to get PrEP prescribed and going in a primary care setting. And uh, after we did um, the work that we did, other primary care settings across the West LA VA um, began to uh, lobby to be the next site to allow primary care um, to prescribe. Um, one of the things that also happened out of that um, was that we were able to get uh, a paper uh, published in the Journal of Primary Care and Community Health just describing the process by which we went through of um, stakeholders and education and all of those things. Um, and I'm happy to share the paper. And um, as Lauren said, if you're interested more in kind of the nuts and bolts of what we did, the implementing prep webinar is there for you to review and be happy to answer more questions about that. Um, and then uh, that's kind of what we did and kind of what we were presenting on. Um, and so I think now would be a good time to go ahead and uh, share where we are now and what, how this work has uh, informed the work that we do now and our continued, uh, uh, and continued encouragement of uh, getting prep out to all those who need it. So I think that Carrie is the next speaker. All right, thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction. Um, so as she said, uh, my name's Carrie Lynn. Uh, I was the pharmacy, ambulatory care pharmacy resident uh, based out of the West Los Angeles uh, HPAC clinic last year. So I worked alongside with them. Um, so that was my role in the project um, was to just kind of be that voice for pharmacy and um, kind of take on that role for the project. Um, so I was there and then afterwards, after I completed the residency last June, um, I was hired on here um, at the Reno VA as a primary care, like packed clinical pharmacy specialist. Um, so I came here and um, I have my clinic here that I um, manage uh, chronic disease state patients. Um, we do not have a current HPACT clinic here at the Reno VA. So um, I do, I, I did have some patients that would come through with in transitional housing and um, experiencing homelessness as well, um, but it was more of a mixed blend um, for over the last year. Um, as far as PrEP goes here um, and what I've kind of done for, with 
PrEP since then is um, one of our current pharmacy residents uh, this year at the Reno VA um, took on a PrEP prescribing project, which I acted as one of the preceptors throughout this year. So um, it's set up a little bit differently. Just um, the facility here is quite a bit smaller than the West Los Angeles VA. Um, so we, and it, the roles are a little bit different. We have specific infectious disease pharmacists here. And just with the size difference and logistics and flow here at this facility, it still does come out of the infectious disease department, but it is prescribed and managed by pharmacists. So the main point of the project this year was to um, figure out how we can make sure that we are capturing all of the eligible patients for PrEP. Um, so that's been an ongoing project this year, which, of course, kind of came to a bit of a slowdown in light of COVID and everything like that. But I'm really hoping that um, with the new group of residents starting next month and as things start to reopen, hopefully we can kind of resume what we were working on. Um, and then in really exciting and recent news, as of last week, um, we are actually starting an HPACT clinic here at the Reno VA, which I'm really, really thrilled about. Um, and I, I just accepted an offer to be the new um, HPACT clinical pharmacy specialist for that. So I'm very, very excited to resume my work with the focus on the homeless, popula homeless veteran population to just get that going again and um, help get this clinic up and running with everything I um, took from the West LA HPAC clinic last year. So definitely looking forward to that whenever it can get up and running. So that's kind of what I'm um, looking to get going on really soon, hopefully. Um, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to our next speaker, which is going to be Sonia. So thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Carrie. Um, my name is Sonia Jefferson. I'm a head vash social worker over at the Long Beach VA, and I was a the first social work fellow over at West LA um, in the HPAC clinic. And my contribution to the project, not as medical driven as the other two, but it was more from a social standpoint on um, talking about the population, dealing with the homeless veterans, um, bringing more light to social workers, because a lot of the social workers at HPAC had not even heard of PrEP, didn't know what that was about. So it was more about getting information out and also helped with um, spearheading the survey to see the per, you know providers, how they felt about prescribing PrEP, if this is something they wanted to do, and we found out that a lot of it was just because they were unaware what PrEP was, what it was going, what it was about, you know, how do you prescribe it. So that's kind of my part in the project. Now what I'm doing now going forward, um, I accepted a position at Long Beach, as I stated, and had that social worker. I'm in the housing department, so I help house um, our homeless veterans that come through HUD Bash that have a voucher. And so not really dealing a lot with PrEP right now, but I have contacted the um, program manager over infectious disease. She's a clinical pharmacist. And they don't have an HPAC program as well at Long Beach. And so what they do, they have a PrEP clinic. And the pharmacists there totally deal with prescribing PrEP. The PCP providers are not involved or anything like that. And so getting in contact with her, I will be working with her in, in August because they're going to revamp their whole process. Because right now in Long Beach, it takes about, it's a 10 to 15 day delay in order for someone to be prescribed PrEP. And that's because they go through a consult, they get their labs, it's a face-to-face -face meeting, it's a whole lot going on with that. And so future-wise is to get rid of the consult process. And by doing that, the time frame is three to four days. So obviously it's a big, um, a big increase, a better increase in helping prescribe PrEP. And here again, <clears throat> excuse me, here again, the pharmacist will be totally in charge of that. Um, PCP providers at Long Beach, from my understanding, they're not real comfortable with wanting to prescribe PrEP not knowing exactly what the drug is and, and just leaving it more to 
the um, the pharmacist. Um, and so that I'm pretty excited about being a part of that program. And I was just reaching out and just from the information that I had learned from from HPAC and just prior experience from dealing with PrEP. So I'm pretty excited about that process. So that's all I have right now. Um, I guess we go over to what panel discussion now. If there's any questions. Oh, I have, I've, I'm going to, up, this is Elizabeth. I'm going to update about what I've been doing since the. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> um, so um, I was a, a MP resident. That was my role during our QI project. Um, and so uh, I, during the, the pro project for at HPACT, I was working with the, my fellow providers to understand the barriers that they felt existed uh, to pre prescribing PrEP. Um, I started working at the San Francisco VA in September, um, which was um, which was a wonderful uh, transition, and I immediately started working with um, the local team uh, here who were trying to bring PrEP prescribing to primary care. And so um, with the experience that I had gathered at West LA, I was able to share a lot of the VA resources that had taken us a bit of time to gather in West LA and immediately present them. Um, so we were able to really speed things up pretty significantly. So by the time um, I arrived in September, by December, uh, we'd already been granted authorization in primary care to prescribe PrEP. Um, and I also worked with the downtown clinic, uh, which is the HPAC clinic for San Francisco, and similarly was able to really share the, the nuts and bolts of the work that we had done in West LA, and again, just drastically, dramatically accelerate um, the approval process within the system. Um, again, we had buy-in from the infectious disease um, uh, department in San Francisco VA to do this. Um, and so kind of where we are in San Francisco right now is that uh, primary care providers, assuming they feel comfortable, um, can initiate PrEP without ID consult. Um, the one caveat is that since we last met uh, last June, um, there has been another formulation of PrEP uh, approved, um, the SCOVI which is being reserved for veterans uh, who have a lower uh, functioning uh, kidneys. And so uh, the ID uh, department kind of wanted to put make that a stop point, which is if we had renal concerns, they really wanted to be involved. And similarly, if we were working with a veteran who also had hepatitis B, which um, is not a contraindication to PrEP, but is a consideration, requires a little bit of more complex management potentially, that they be involved in care with those providers. Um, and so uh, one of the other things that we have done at San Francisco VA uh, is we have designated a PrEP champion per half day so that if providers are unsure or a little hesitant or just have questions about prep prescribing or nurses or LVNs or any member of the care team uh, has a question, they know who they can go to to ask those questions. We Pre-COVID, we even had a sash that we wore um, during that half day so that we were very clear that we were open to those questions. And um, I think that has been Again, it's really accelerated people's willingness to uh, be open to taking on um, PrEP prescribing because we have really been clear that they're always going to be a resource that they can go to and uh, have access to. Um, and we do anticipate um, that in uh, September, uh, the generic form of Truvada will become available. Um, and at least local to um, California, uh, our governor and our legislature has passed a ruling that will allow pharmacists to dispense uh, both PrEP 
and PEP, uh, 30 days without a prescription. Um, and so we do feel like it's likely that um, there will be people who self-initiate um, those meds on their own and then come to us uh, for continuation. And it also just, because of that change and who can prescribe it in what setting, it did really feel like it was imperative to get primary care, um, particularly uh, in our HPAC clinic, really aware of and on board with how to prescribe PrEP. And the reality is, is that it, there's a lot less risk for PrEP than there is for insulin. And people feel very, very comfortable prescribing insulin and changing diabetes medications. Um, and the amount of monitoring that is required is pretty similar. Um, and so we've just really tried to um, lower people's anxiety um, to increase uptake of, of providers willing to initiate PrEP, willing to have those conversations with their veterans. And uh, we did, in San Francisco, receive notice that our um, local sites, the downtown clinic and the um, medical practice at the San Francisco VA have had the highest number of increased, uh, highest percentage of increased prescriptions. So we have been, um, it's been working. People have been prescribing more and probably asking questions more. Um, before COVID, uh, the next thing that we were going to work on was ensuring um, self-swabbing for gonorrhea, chlamydia at all of our labs. Um, that has been put on hold for multiple reasons, including um, lab uh, overload um, and uh, just lab and ID bandwidth, uh, because ID also, of course, got very pulled into the uh, coronavirus concerns. Um, but that will be something that I will continue to, to work on. Um, so that we really do make sure that we are making, initiating and maintaining uh, veterans on PrEP as easy as possible. Um, so I, I do consider myself a PrEP champion and I hope to continue to, to carry that within the San Francisco VA um, and really try to uh, demonstrate that um, we are a good and safe place to go um, for patient care. That's kind of uh, where I am now. And so, yeah, we would love to uh, open, uh, I guess, the chat box uh, to questions and see where we are from now. Great. Thank you all so much for sharing um, the work that you're doing now and kind of how that has evolved over the last year. Again, please go ahead and um, add your questions to the chat. Um, I have several, so I can get us kicked off while folks are thinking. Um, so my first question, um, I think, is especially relevant for Carrie and Elizabeth, but how did your work with patients experiencing homelessness inform your current work, especially um, in light of the fact that you're working with a more mixed general veteran population? Uh, I can start. I mean, I, I do still have a significant number of homeless veterans within my panel, um, and the and I'm a provider that has uh, kind of made it known that I am very open to working with homeless veterans. Um, and I think that, you know, I think it's all of those things. I think it's trauma-informed care. I think it's understanding the local resources um, I think it's knowing the context for care within the San Francisco Bay Area, which is different than other places. San Francisco Bay, um, Bay Area has a lot of uh, healthcare resources for um, those without income, um, experiencing homelessness, et cetera. Um, there have been people who have been uh, veterans who are homeless who have been very skeptical, very uh, reluctant to receive care from the VA, but have been on PrEP um, or utilized PEP in the past through a community re resource. Um, so 
you know, having conversations about, again, ex potential exposure risk, about um, past experiences with uh, HIV care, either preventive um, or, you know, experiences people they know might know have had um, is a different conversation for sure um, within San Francisco than it might be other places. Um, but it definitely, if nothing else, it's made it very clear to me that, um, you know, the homeless population needs to be asked these questions and we need to allow them to disclose and um, potential risk factors and, and then not just let that lay there to actually pick it up and say, oh, you know, it looks like you have this history of um, uh, 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 survival sex. You know, tell me more about that. What can we, how can I help you um, stay safe with that? Um, and for some of my veterans, it has been uh, an awareness of their own that potentially they are not stable enough to commit to a daily medication such as uh, PrEP but to know that this is somewhere that they can come to for PEP, um, post-exposure prophylaxis has been, it's been a game changer for them. And I've had, you know, probably two or three veterans now come to me for, for PEP, even though I'm like, please don't wait, <laughs> go to the emergency department. Um, but, um, you know, it's been a good, it's been a good, conversation and it's one that I definitely try to have and I wear a ask me about prep button on my uh, lanyard. Um, this is Carrie just to kind of bounce off of what Elizabeth said. Um, after, I think a lot of what she said is brought up a lot of really good points. Um, I'm really looking forward to this transition over to fully focusing on HPACT again um, as a pharmacist in there. And one, one thing that I definitely want to do in regards to PrEP is uh, work with our infectious disease pharmacists here to hopefully, you know, figure out a process um, specifically in the HPAC clinic um, because it is really important. Every, I don't want to completely repeat everything Elizabeth said, but it's you know, veterans in general are at a higher risk, and then homeless veterans on top of that are at that much higher of a risk for um, acquiring HIV. So um, I, I definitely just want to continue my work to advocate for this medication because um, it's very efficacious if used correctly. So, but you really do have to just get in there and ask these questions and um, have those conversations to determine who's eligible for this treatment. And I think that we can really, there's a lot we can do to pick up more and more patients who are eligible that may never have even realized it. So, um, yeah, so I, and I, just working with the homeless population in general last year, just it, you really have, like what Elizabeth said too, as I transition into my new role, I want to really educate myself about our community resources here. Um, because it is so much more, like for me as a pharmacist, it's so much more than me just prescribing and managing meds um, and changing doses and things. When you're working with this population, you there's so much more you really truly have to consider, um, like the social context and things like that. So um, there's a lot, I mean, it definitely last year had a huge impact on how I want to work clinically as well, so. Hi, Thank this you. is Sonia. Can I chime in just a little bit? Yes, yeah, please. I was going to ask. <laughs> uh, from a social standpoint and being a social worker, not, you know, not being able to prescribe, one thing that I've noticed is that I like and what I've noticed is that being on the front line with a homeless veteran, even though I'm at HPAC, I'm sorry, HUDVASH, excuse me, was at HPAC. Being at HUDVASH and dealing with homeless veterans that are trying to get housed that were on the street, I have found that I've been able to talk to them. And you have to be willing to talk to them about um, their sexual lifestyle, what's going on with their lifestyle, to see if they're even open to PrEP. Because sometimes they're not even aware of what PrEP is, to be perfectly honest. And I have found that out. And I have talked to my colleagues about PrEP. 
in the event that they come across someone that is open to talk about um, some of their issues surrounding unprotected sex or survival sex, as Elizabeth had said, or, or anything like that, you know, lots of partners and, and that kind of thing and trying to keep them safe. So being on the front line in that aspect as a social worker, being open to have those discussions and not be afraid to have those discussions. And I noticed that with um, my colleagues, it, it is an area that you have to be really confident and open to talking about. So there are a few of my colleagues that actually have um, prep in their office as far as on their wall and, and handout. So you have to be on that front line to, you know, to engage before they even get to the medical side of it. So um, for me, I would like to be more involved with that and having those conversations to even get them to the place of wanting to be prescribed PrEP. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very important point, kind of tying back in some of those social contexts in which um, kind of a pharmacist or a primary care provider are able to work on the prescribing and initiation, but making sure that somebody is working with them on some of the social needs as well. Um, my next question is, what have you learned in your current role that would have been helpful when you were working in the age pact? Kind of the reverse. What have you learned in this last year? Uh, this is Elizabeth again. Um, I'm going to say again just the context of the community. Um, has been enormously helpful. And you know, I have lived in the Bay Area for, uh, since 2007, so a lot of the things were things that I was aware of, um, but I did not have a similar knowledge base for um, West LA. And so there was less, um, less kind of conversations I could have with veterans about potential community resources if they were not comfortable for any number of reasons um, to have having these discussions with um, a federal employee in a federal facility. Um, so having my knowledge base be what it is for the community in which I am currently serving has been really helpful because if there is some hesitation or um, concern on the behalf of the veteran who doesn't want the VA to be in this part of their life to be able to say, you don't have to. Here's where you can go, and here's where you can go for low cost, for free. There, here are the resources um, that you can access, because maybe it's not here. Maybe getting here and trying to find parking and doing all of these things um, is not what makes sense in your life. but here's what I can give you in terms of where else you can get that care. And then, you know, as a primary care provider with an interest in prescribing PrEP, letting that go and saying, okay, this is not, it's not, it's not personal. And if I can get them a, attached to the care that they need outside of me, I need to provide those resources to allow them to do that. I completely agree with, this is Carrie, um, I completely agree with what Elizabeth said about being more knowledgeable about community resources um, because I'm originally from this area, northern Nevada, um, so I feel like I just kind of naturally have more of an idea of other clinics that are outside of the VA where this could be a resource for patients and just other sort of programs in general that are, that, you know, kind of focus in homeless outreach. Um, so just kind of having that knowledge of the other resources for these patients, exactly what Elizabeth said, I think is really helpful because last year I was new to LA and then I was only there for the one year. So I just didn't have that knowledge base of community resources. So I guess it would be helpful for people, especially, you know, especially residents going through programs that if they're new to the area in general, I think even though it's VA, it would be really helpful, especially in an HPAC clinic, to kind of make those community resources 
like educate the residents and those rotating through about things they can share with the patients. Because I think that would have been, looking back to last year, I think that would have really kind of solidified my work more, being able to have be a, a source of information for a lot of my patients in HPACT. This is Sonia, and I can agree with both Elizabeth and Carrie. Um, I'm actually from Northern California and working in LA because I've had a past history I've worked with AIDS Project LA. I knew about that resource that I could, you know, offer to the veterans. Now being in Long Beach, I'm not familiar with Long Beach at all, but I have let my colleagues know about um, they have AIDS Project LA in Long Beach. So some of the some of my colleagues are aware of that, and I know that we've had a few veterans that I know of, of on for sure that have reached out to Age Project LA, and it was more for our housing. Um, but it's good to just know the resources within the community because I've been exposed to some veterans that you know that don't want the VA in, in their business when it comes to certain things, not all the things, but certain things. So I definitely would agree with having more resources within the area that we can offer. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that that translates well into other settings too, kind of having an idea of who your community partners are and who you can reach out to for new staff and residents and um, even thinking about uh, Elizabeth's comment about comfort level and seeking some of those resources. I think um, even considering provider type in that regard, um, maybe someone's more comfortable talking with the social worker or um, the doctor or the nurse and kind of understanding kind of that relationship. Um, so I think that's a really helpful um, insight. Um, my next question is, um, looking back, what advice do you have for providers who are working to initiate PrEP for their patients? Um, or what do you wish you had known? <laughs> uh, this is Elizabeth again. I think I, I just can't overemphasize how safe these medications are. Um, and, you know, so it does, you know, there do need to be some criteria. People need to have a good kidney function. Uh, they need to be willing to take a daily medication. Um, they need to get uh, uh, regular uh, HIV testing, um, and we do strongly recommend uh, semi-regular uh, renal testing as well as testing for other STIs. But it's a, you know, the reality is to start, as long as they've got working kidneys and are HIV negative, everything else can kind of be managed. Um, and, and, when you are able to have a conversation with a patient really getting into what is going on in their lives, they're so grateful that you're interested. Um, and so many um, patients, even if they ultimately decide that PrEP is not what they are interested in, have never been asked um, truly about uh, injection drug practices or about the type um, of sex that they have and making it routine for every single person to ask, you know, are you sexually active? With whom? Do you have sex with men, women, or both? You know, have you ever been uh, paid for sex or, or paid for sex? It, you know, you get your 88-year-old, um, for me, a veteran who's looking at me like, are you crazy? But, you know, when you do it routinely, it sounds like it's a question that you're asking routinely. It doesn't sound like it's a question that is targeted. Um, and you get some really um, sometimes surprising results. And people are often willing to disclose because they're so disarmed by the fact that you're actually – um, expressing an interest. And so I think the therapeutic alliance that can be developed by really, really actually asking the questions and then 
just really how safe this medication is, um, you know, I think are, are the biggest takeaways and why I really um, hope that more providers uh, develop willingness and competency in um, prescribing PrEP. Yeah, I to just bounce off of that, um, I think last year when we did this project in the HPAC clinic, we just really, I mean, even myself, I, I didn't even realize the broad scope of eligibility for PrEP for patients. So it, it, it like just a lot of our providers, when we held our educational sessions with them, they were really surprised of who is truly eligible for this medication and just normalizing that conversation, like what Elizabeth just said, just making that part of routine primary care to ask those questions and make it a normal conversation. Great. Um, my next question is kind of addressing one of the points that Elizabeth mentioned about um, folks may not have the stability to initiate daily medication. Um, especially if they have um, housing stability or a lot of other considerations. Um, but for folks who are still interested in initiating PrEP, what are some of the strategies that you would recommend or have seen um, successful in helping folks who are housing unstable to maintain PrEP once they've initiated? Um, well, one thing that you can do to help adherence to the medication that sometimes is beneficial for patients, especially if they don't have such a stable sort of environment to keep track of medications and things like that, is you can always prescribe a shorter duration of therapy. Um, I mean, we even we have some patients that, you know, we'll just do like 10 days at a time, that kind of a thing. So sometimes that can help keep them on track a little bit more. Then they don't have to, you know, keep track of as many medications and tablets all at once. Um, so just kind of working with them to really figure out what their routine looks like, if there's any at all. And um, I would say the alteration of the supply of medication is definitely a tactic that we can use. I don't know if Elizabeth has other things in mind, but that's definitely a, a go-to for pharmacy. I think that's right. Um, and then, you know, just putting things in context you know, trials are ongoing um, for alternatives, including non-oral um, forms, so long-lasting injections right. um, and things like that. So that's not where we are now, but it is coming down um, the pike um, because, you know, it works. PrEP works. Um, and it is a huge, uh, in terms of overall health care costs, you know, one prevention is about worth four hundred thousand um, dollars, five hundred thousand um, dollars versus HIV treatment. Um, so it's a huge cost saving to this to the system if we can prevent it. Um, you know, within the VA, we uh, really can only prescribe based upon FDA uh, recommendations. But mm -hmm. you know, for providers in the community, um, there are some studies as well that. Um, uh, you should look into um, that discuss uh, on-demand uh, dosing of PrEP as well. Um, again, that is not something that in any way as an employee of the VA I yeah. am recommending, <laughs> um, but they are out there. Um, and so I think that uh, there are ways to have conversations with veterans about really identifying what their risk profile is and um, matching what we have available to their risk profile because PEP is post-exposure um, prophylaxis PEP is also very effective um, if it's initiated you know as close to uh, um, the uh, contact of concern as possible no more than 72 hours so you know for veterans with very or patients with very very unstable lives um, they do have to take that for 30 days consecutively as well, but it may be, you know, another alternative. Um, but I am definitely looking forward to um, some of the 
injectable formulations that look like they should be coming up within the next couple years. And I don't know if I mentioned, but generic Truvada should be coming in the market um, in September, which could be a, a game changer as well. Definitely will lower costs for the uninsured. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's great news. Um, Sonia, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add from a social work perspective as far as um, helping folks maintain adherence. Well, I know um, just things that I've done in the past, not necessarily a, a PrEP patient, but I've worked closely with PCP providers and their psychologists or psychiatrists in the event, you know, for maintaining appointments. Um, because a social worker has a different relationship sometimes with, you know, with a veteran versus a psychologist or their, you know, their, you know, their doctor or what have you. So sometimes I found that I've been able to remind um, veterans of appointments. I've had um, PCP providers reach out to me when they couldn't get in contact with, with their veterans to remind them, hey, make sure, you know, da da da, little stuff like that. So I would say just having a close relationship with a social worker, if the veteran is connected with a social worker, to kind of help assist in making sure they stay on track with whatever they need. And I think another, uh, just one more thing is that when people understand what this medication is, if they recognize their own risk for HIV acquisition, um, mm -hmm. people are pretty self-motivated to stay on it. Um, so it's, it feels different than a blood pressure medication or a diabetes medication um, for which the day-to-day -day reasoning for taking it um, in terms of reducing a long-term um, health effect may not be as clear. Um, you know, people understand that they don't want HIV in a way that they might not understand that they don't want kidney failure in 20 years from their untreated diabetes. Um, so I have found that patients who tell me that they are they want to go down this this route are very very adherent to it I've got veterans who have been in the uh, COVID lockdown shelter in place and have not seen another person in two months and tell me they have not missed a single dose um, because it's now part of how they identify they identify as someone who is on prep and trying to dramatically reduce their risk for HIV. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree with you. Great. <laughs> um, one of the things that came up earlier, um, I think all of you mentioned kind of uh, the comfort of others in feeling comfortable prescribing PrEP and um, Elizabeth, you've talked about how safe the medication is, but are there some specific um, like talking points or resources that you've been able to point folks to to help increase their comfort level in prescribing? Um, so last year, I mean, in our in our specific project, this is Carrie. Um, we did provide like a pocket card. We created one for our providers in our clinic to use, um, but. Um, in the VA system, there's there's a really good kind of resource hub for prep information that anyone can access, and there are, there are definitely points in there about conversation starters. Um, maybe Elizabeth can help remind me, but um, isn't it called the five P's for like five? Yeah. It's like five directed questions that kind of help guide that conversation to start gauging eligibility for prep therapy. So that's a really helpful resource that I think is available to anybody if you look it up. Um, and that just kind of starts, it, that really helps guide that conversation, especially if it's new and maybe doesn't feel comfortable right away, but it kind of helps start normalizing that conversation. I'm sure Elizabeth has more to bounce off of from that, but, but those are definitely a couple of things that we did and directed our providers to. Yeah, so the five Ps are partners, practices, past history of STIs, 
um, current protection strategies for um, for STIs and um, pregnancy plans. Um, the CDC has a really great website full of um, good uh, resources. Um, and then Health and Human Services has a campaign right now um, to uh, end HIV, and they have a lot of um, good services because PrEP is definitely, PrEP and PEP are definitely um, huge parts of, of that effort. Um, so, and I do want to, one more thing, want to give a shout out to, uh, the CDC has mapping about community um, uh, community uh, spread of HIV, um, and so you can really get pretty deep into um, this, the risk for a specific person within a community. Sorry, that's AIDS view, um, AIDSVU.org. Um, um, I'll put that uh, link in the chat. Um, so you can really dive into your local community setting to understand the prevalence for HIV, um, which then can help um, orient you to the practice setting that you're in and this you know, potential risk. Um, and then uh, H the CDC, the tool that I was talking about was their uh, HIV re risk reduction tool. And so in there, you can put in a couple of different uh, items related to a specific patient in front of you to better understand what their risk might be if you are still trying to learn about this and understand uh, kind of who you should be talking to um, and getting to know your patients a little bit better. Thank you for sharing that resource, Elizabeth. Um, I think we've all kind of talked about COVID, and I know that it's not far from anyone's mind right now. Um, and in light of the current pandemic and um, the fact that HIV was the last or most recent real epidemic that we've experienced um, here in America, um, I was wondering kind of how your work has changed and, and your work with people experiencing homelessness and your work around PrEP um, in light of COVID and in light of some of the social distancing measures that we've had to, to put in place. Well, um, this is Sonia. Um, one thing I can say was um, dealing with being in, in HUDVASH. Uh, we've had a lot of community partners out that are aiding the homeless, so they're putting them in hotels so they're not on the street to try to keep them safe um, and the social distancing. And right now in HUDBASH, we're experiencing a lot of our veterans are in their 60s, 70s, and we even have some that are in their 80s. So it's, it's really, really been um, helpful that hotels are now provided for these veterans and so they're able to stay in um, safe spaces and um, attempt to look for housing which has been a barrier for a lot of our veterans because landlords are not showing properties as easy you know as it used to be it's all appointment based and of course you have to have you you know your um, your mask on and and so forth so that's been a it's been a barrier for a lot of our veterans it's in some of like I said because we're dealing with an older population now transportation because um, they're put in hotels and not necessarily close to the VA or close to where um, they could you know look at an apartment so there are some barriers that are coming up but overall um, I it, it's just changing the whole landscape um, we in HUDVASH are totally teleworking. Um, we're not even available. We're not doing any face-to-face -face with our veterans unless we absolutely have to. And that's a rare, it, it's actually become very, very rare. Everything can be done over the phone or um, we've had permission now to, to FaceTime and so, you know, using technology to, and getting permission to, um, 
computer signatures and, and that kind of thing. So for us, it's, it's been a little difficult. It's a little slower in getting veterans housed, but it's, I'm very thankful that um, they're able to put veterans in hotels and get them off the street. So I'm very appreciative to that. That's all I have. Um, this is Carrie. Um, so I have been doing a combination of telework um, for my clinic. I've done a few uh, video appointments and then um, mostly phone appointments. And then otherwise, I've been helping cover in our outpatient pharmacy quite a bit, too. So um, as far as, I mean, the, the big thing with the homeless population is the they might not have the resources to do, especially a video appointment and sometimes not even a phone appointment. So I'll be really curious to see how this new HPAC clinic here kind of starts to function. Um, we still aren't seeing any face-to-face -face primary care providers are seeing face-to-face -face appointments um, at this point, but pharmacy is not yet. So we'll kind of just see how that goes. Um, but when I'm working outpatient, we definitely have a lot of um, our homeless patients having to come in to get meds because they um, don't have a mailing address. So um, those are, that has pretty been limited to basically that population coming in to pick up meds. It's starting to pick up a little bit more now, but for a long time that's what it was looking like. So I've been kind of doing a combination myself. Yes, yeah, and as I was sharing a little bit earlier, I think before the call began, um, I am a primary care provider. Most of the care that I have been providing has been virtual care for the last several months, but um, um, I have been starting to see my own uh, patients for a half day a week and then seeing uh, some urgent care patients a half day a week in person. And um, since I started seeing um, my own patients, we're really trying to prioritize uh, those patients who are not able to use a a virtual visit modality, um, and that definitely includes our homeless veterans um, who, you know, have don't have the resources that they might need to do all of the care that we are trying to do virtually. Um, and then, interestingly, the last two um, uh, times I have had my inpatient, my in-person care, I have initiated prep uh, two of the visits, and one is with a homeless veteran with multiple risk factors, both sexual and um, drug related, who he and I have been talking about uh, harm reduction and PEP and PrEP for several months. And he has been very forthcoming and able to recognize that previously he was not a PrEP candidate just for how chaotic his life was, but he has been housed um, since the uh, COVID restrictions went into place in one of the um, COVID hotels. And so we're like, well, let's let's try this. Let's try starting it. And if it doesn't work, then you know we'll know that. But this is probably as stable as you're going to be, and this is a way for us to. And people are working. Our social work team is working with him to get more permanent housing. Um, no, but this is uh, this is kind of where we are. And we have been very mindful about um, about labs and about uh, requiring people to come in for testing. Um, you know, the we do absolutely though need. Um, uh, negative HIV uh, testing to be able to continue a PrEP prescription, and we also need negative HIV and functioning kidneys and all of those various things to initiate. And so, you know, in that sense, there are some hard, um, there are still some, you know, hard uh, lines that we need to draw in terms of uh, veterans being able to um, receive care, but they do not, um, at least in our facility, uh, veterans don't need an appointment um, to get labs um, and can drop into the clinic for swabs if they need them. And so that doesn't require an in-person uh, visit with a 
a, a provider. They can just come in and either self-swab or the RNs or LVNs can help them with the swabbing. Um, and I was saying question about community health workers to help with education. Um, my VA does not use community health workers. I have used community health workers in the past in other roles, and I love them. And yes, I think that that role is critical um, and um, probably if you have one good, well-trained, enthusiastic community health worker, you will knock down so many more barriers than uh, several well-meaning providers because they're, you know, these are people who can talk to um, our patients in a way that we can't and give them real information um, in a different setting, in a different role. Um, I wish we had community health workers. I know how, how amazing and awesome they can be. But we, at least in San Francisco VA, we don't have them. Thank you. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, I want to thank you all again for, for joining us today, for presenting. I know I could talk to you about your work all day. Um, and so I just really appreciate it. Um, for folks on the line, um, presentation materials and a link to the archived webinar will be available on our website, nhchc.org. Um, and an evaluation of today's presentation will open. Um, so please uh, fill that out. We really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, I know that this conversation has really helped um, to showcase that uh, folks who work in homeless health care are really leading the way for some innovative work across the country. Um, and so I thank you again for sharing your experience. Um, our webinar is now closed. Have a great day, everyone.